This is KGW News at 11. We begin at 11 with breaking news in the manhunt for a Cowlitz County deputies killer. Authorities confirm they have shot and killed a suspect, and now we're hearing they have two others in custody. KGW's Lindsay Nadrich is live in Kalama, and she's been tracking all of this police activity for us. Lindsay? Yeah, I just spoke with the Cowlitz County Sheriff Brad Thurman a few minutes ago. He says the officer shot and killed the suspect believed to be responsible for the death of Deputy Justin DeRozier. Investigators and the SWAT team have been working in this area all day, but say this whole thing is finally over and they can start investigating. The suspect is dead and two of his associates are in custody. The sheriff's office is breathing a sigh of relief. Well, I think it's a big relief to all of us in law enforcement and as well as the community that uh, we have uh, believe we've uh, wrapped it up. The community is no longer in danger. The sheriff's office is not releasing the name of the suspect who was shot and killed by officers at this time. That will be released later by the coroner's office. But they're confident they got their man and know who he is. They say he was spotted coming out of the woods wet and muddy, very close to Spencer Creek Road just before 7 this evening. Officers responded and confronted him and say he pulled out a gun. That's when officers opened fire, shooting and killing him. No officers were hurt. They believe he is the man who shot and killed Deputy DeRozier after he he responded to a parking complaint about a motorhome on Fallert Road around 930 last night. Also today, we saw the SWAT team serve a search warrant at a home on Vincent Road looking for that suspect earlier, but he wasn't there. Deputies say they also arrested two brothers named Matthew and Michael Veach, who are associated with the suspect, but weren't directly involved in the shooting of Deputy DeRozier. Matthew Veach is in jail, charged with rendering assistance. Michael Veach is being held on a Department of Corrections warrant. So again, this investigation is still ongoing, but they say the community is no longer in danger and the suspect responsible for the death of Deputy DeRozier is dead. Back to you. Almost 24 hours after that deputy was killed. Lindsay Nadrich alive with that update. Lindsay, thank you so much. And grappling with this tragedy has made for a horrific day in the Kalama area, both for law enforcement and for those they vow to protect. Late last night, just went around, checked all my windows. People living near Kalama were terrified. Me and my mom kind of locked up the house, kind of bunker down, stay safe. Hearing word of an officer shot and a gunman on the loose would be scary anywhere. Here, it's unheard of. This is one of the safest places. No drug addicts, no shooting. It just doesn't happen up here. Fast forward 24 hours, the reality is setting in. Deputy Justin DeRozier was a husband, a father, and a man who swore to protect people here. Tonight, he's been taken, and a small town's peace of mind has been shattered. I'm just praying for the family. Heartbroken, sad, confused, of course wondering why. Deputy DeRozier's widow gave KGW permission to use these photos. She called him one of a kind who was loved by many. For authorities today, the emotional toll was overwhelming. He loved his job. He was incredibly good at it. And as you can imagine, as I'm obviously showing, this is a very personal uh, for our agency. Lord, we don't understand why, but we do understand that uh, you're in control. Tonight, people in the Kalama area came together for a vigil. So we ask for you to pour out your peace upon the family, pour out your peace upon this community. The crowd was big. The pain was evident. I, I was born and raised in Kelso. I was born and raised in Cowlitz County. Um, I did leave for maybe two or three years, but I came back and it, it was rare that we made national news or it was rare, rare that we made Portland news or anything. And now it just, it's happening way too much. And our condolences go out to that community and stay with KGW as we continue following this story. Obviously, so many updates throughout the day. So we'll keep you posted on air and online at KGW.com and, of course, on our social media pages.
Well, moving on tonight, a second officer was also shot last night in Milwaukee in what appears to be a horrific coincidence. He's been released from the hospital, we're told, and he's recovering from multiple gunshot wounds to his leg. Just before 1130, police say the officer saw a man who may have been a suspect in a reported gun threat near Monroe Street and 42nd Avenue. Police say the officer tried to tase that man, but it didn't work. And then they say they exchanged gunfire with the man the officer was hit. The suspect is seen year, uh, here. His name is Douglas Teeter, and he was found hiding under a truck and camper. And police say they had to tase him again to take him into custody. Now to one of our other top stories of the night. A former Jesuit high school student has died after falling from a clock tower in New York City. This happened at Fordham University where she was attending school. KTW's Morgan Romero is here with what we know so far in this story. Morgan. Well, Maggie, 22 year old Sydney Monfries was a senior at Fordham University just weeks from getting her bachelor's degree in journalism. In fact, she was an intern here at KGW in 2016 tonight. Her life was cut short too soon. Sydney succumbed to her injuries hours after falling from an off limits tower notorious for thrill seeking students. Authorities say around three o'clock this morning, 22 year old Sydney Monfries and her friends snuck into Fordham University's campus clock tower to get a better view of the city. NBC New York reports officials say it appeared they were climbing a set of stairs when Monfries fell 30 to 40 feet through a hole in the landing. Emergency responders found her on the ground and rushed her to a nearby hospital. She died earlier tonight. Originally from Portland, Monfries was a senior at Fordham studying journalism. These photos are from what appears to be her Facebook page. Monfries was just weeks from graduating. In a letter to students, the university president said their hearts go out to Sydney's family and friends. He said, quote, there are no words sufficient to describe the loss of someone so young and full of promise. The school is awarding her a degree posthumously. The president of Portland's Jesuit High School confirmed to KGW Monfries graduated from Jesuit in 2015. Dozens of people attended a service in the campus chapel tonight to pray for the Monfries family. She briefly interned in the marketing department at KGW in the summer of 2016. This photo posted on her Instagram shows her sitting at the anchor desk. Fordham students say the off limits tower climb is somewhat of a tradition done before graduating. Not an official tradition, but yeah. It's a sort of like a fun thing to do and just try to sneak in and actually touch it. It's not clear how Monfries and her friends got in. A university spokeswoman says the access door to the bell tower is always locked. But students tell NBC New York something different. There is a door, yeah, that you can get up there, and it's usually open when they clean it. NYPD and university authorities are investigating Monfrey's death. They're also trying to figure out how students were able to access the bell tower when it was supposed to be locked. Maggie. Yeah, a lot of questions in this one. Morgan Romero live for us. Morgan, thank you so much. Well, police have launched a homicide investigation after a woman's body was found in northeast Portland. Officers say someone found this body this morning in a wooded area here on this map near Hasselow Street and 62nd Avenue. That's in the Rose City Park neighborhood. Investigators say this death is suspicious. All right, everybody, let's change gears here tonight. It was a huge win for the Portland Trailblazers in the first playoff game against Oklahoma City. And fans are so excited about this win. It's keeping their hopes up this year. KGW's Orlando Sanchez is here now to break down the game. Orlando, I don't mean to make it sound so desperate, but it's a big deal after all these years. Absolutely, and it was a huge party at the Moda Center. Why not? It's been a long time coming since Rip City got a taste of playoff success. They had to answer questions about it all year long, embarrassed last postseason, but that 10 game losing streak in the playoffs is over. The Moda Center rocking a packed house for game number one between the Blazers and Thunder. Portland came out of the gates on fire. It was raining threes out there. They built up a 19 point lead and big man Ennis Cantor, he was sensational. Chalked up 20 points, 18 rebounds. Only Bill Walton and LaMarcus Aldridge had a stat line like that in the playoffs. Cantor was a problem against his old team. Damian Lillard called Cantor the MVP of the game. But it was close down the stretch. 
and Lillard came up big when the Blazers needed him most. Leading the way with 30 points, Portland wins 104 to 99. Their first playoff victory since 2016. You know, we learned from it. It was a good experience for us. I'm glad we had to go through it. But now we know what it takes to kind of get over the hump, and we're looking forward to the challenge. Last year we didn't win a game, and this year we did. It's only one game. You know, I think that's that's all it is. We we know we know how it feels to win again, and now we can just you know kind of move on from that. Now it's a best of seven series, game two. Tuesday night right here in Rip City. Now coming up on Sports Sunday, we'll find out what Edis Cantor told general manager Neil Olshay when he ran into him near the locker room. Maggie, back right. to you. Orlando, thank you so much. I was going to plug Sports Sunday for you, but you did it yourself. Everybody Appreciate stick the around. Love. Yes. You're very welcome. Starts at 1130. We'll see you soon, man. And hey, as he mentioned, game two is Tuesday night at the Moda Center. I may or may not have tickets myself. After that, the series moves to Oklahoma City for game three Friday night. And of course, we have much more at KGW.com, including full post-game press conferences, plus a special edition of our three-on-three -three podcast. Check it out.